Okay, well, good afternoon, folks, and thank you very much uh, for coming along. And thank you to the um, Biosa office for once again running um, this rather tremendous summer uh, event of the Biosa Brings You uh, that allows people to come and talk mm -hmm. about different topics and ideas close to their hearts. Um, so I'll just bring up my slides and then crack on with this afternoon's talk. So thank you for coming along. Um, my name's Paul and I'm a lecturer at the University of Exeter um, and I'm also a research associate at the Walfowl Wetlands Trust. And what I'd like to talk to you about this afternoon um, is a rather special anniversary of something that's really quite important to animal behaviour science, um, which is the 60th anniversary of Tinbergen's Four Questions. Um, a mechanism that has been used to understand and evaluate animal behaviour for many, many years. And I am an animal behaviour science by training. That's my bread and butter. It's what I do. So um, I use uh, Tim Bergen's questions quite regularly in terms of my own teaching and of my own research. So I thought it would be quite nice if I came along to one of these Biasa Brings You sessions to kind of explain a bit about this area of uh, animal behaviour science and why it's still relevant. So uh, kind of my outline for this talk today is to talk a little bit about the field of ethology, so animal behaviour, and its role in the zoo. So why is there a role for something um, that was first postulated 60 years ago? What does it mean? Why is it there? Uh, we'll also consider what the actual four questions are themselves. And I'll give you some examples of how the four questions link to the zoo and the husbandry of the zoo. And then we will look at how we can move forwards with some of the research that we do in zoos, which is very highly focused on animal behaviour, to consider what types of questions we shall, still should be asking with the, uh, the framework of these four questions in mind. So a very brief introduction to animal behaviour at the zoo. Um, I appreciate that there's going to be people watching this that know a lot about what animal behaviour is, uh, why we still observe animals and collect data on them, and how we apply those data to zoo animal husbandry. But in a nutshell, behaviour can be pure or basic science, or it can be applied science. And we can take information from the basic sciences and we can then turn them into applied questions. So, for example, um, I'm going to start with one of my favourite animals to talk about, which is the giraffe. And if we think about some older studies that have been done on the giraffe, such as this one by um, Robin Pello, who was looking at energy budgets of giraffe in Africa. What do they select for? What types of leaves from what types of trees do they consume? How long do they spend eating? That's pure science. It's interesting stuff that somebody has found out and has now told us a bit more about what giraffes do in the wild. And then we can move that forwards and say, OK, well, this is our science that we know about the animal in the field. What do we then think about how the animal is kept in captivity? And we can then take those pure science questions to form the basis of applied science questions, which allow us to move husbandry forwards. So again, if we have an example of the giraffe and what does the giraffe need in the zoo, shameless plug for one of my old papers, can we develop its husbandry to be more welfare focused because we know exactly what the animal has evolved to do out in the field? So pure science of asking these questions and applied science of applying the information from those questions to a scenario that we are trying to manage. Therefore, what we have is a situation where these two fields of ethology, so the behavioural sciences, pure question and an applied question, can work together to tell us a lot more about the animals that we're looking at. So a very, very brief and potted history of what do I mean by ethology, simply a word that describes the scientific study of behaviour. Ethology can be traced back to everyone's favourite evolution biologist, Charles Darwin, and uh, his theories and principles of natural selection. Although we must remember whenever we talk about Darwin, we always must remember to mention Alfred Russell Wallace as well. He was working at the same time, didn't happen to publish as quickly. But Darwin, in his uh, On the Origin of Species from 1859, 
first writes down the ideas of selection pressures causing particular characteristics and traits on animals to form. And these traits allow behaviours to be performed and those behaviours give the animal an adaptive benefit. So what you can see in this photograph here from the Oxford Museum of Natural History, just some examples of Darwin's works. He used to keep and breed pigeons and he showed that traits were heritable based on the characteristics of parent animals. And therefore, by changing what animals uh, were breeding together, you could change what characteristics that population had in the future. So we're moving from 1859 to uh, the dawn of the 20th century. And this is Charles Henry Turner, um, which is rather sadly forgotten about biologists from the USA. But he was one of the first people to look at learning and memory in insects. He was particularly interested in bees. He did some work on colour and shading differentiation in bees. Um, and he, again, was looking at these pure science questions and attempting to work out why animals were doing particular things in different ways and what benefits did they get from that behaviour. And then finally, the chap that we'll be talking about today and whose theories that this talk is based upon is Nico Tinbergen. And he again was interested in what animals were doing out in the field. He wanted to move animal behavior science out of the lab and look at animals in natural or semi-natural settings to understand the motivation for behavior and where that came from. Does it come from the context of the environment that the animal is in? And Tim Bergen was particularly interested in bird eggs and he was particularly interested in fish. Uh, particularly uh, the red uh, the red bellies of these sticklebacks that you can see um, in this artwork here and the stimuli that this red coloration is to others around that stickleback that has that characteristic and therefore what behaviours are performed. And Tinbergen published widely uh, throughout his lifetime. One of his first books was called The Study of Instinct from 1951 um, and he built his ideas off the backs of discussions with other rather famous animal behaviour scientists of the time. So some of you might have also heard of a chap called Conrad Lorenz uh, that Tim Bergen was very closely associated with. And his probably most famous um, piece of work that we still use today, and that is the kind of reason why I'm talking to you, are his four questions, or sometimes called the four whys, that explain and help us understand why animal behavior is being performed. So this paper you can find and download for free is called On the Aims and Methods of Ethology. Just simply put that title into Google Scholar and the full paper will come up. And what the four questions are is a framework for looking at what starts off a behavior, what causes it, what initiates its performance. How does that behavior develop across the course of the individual's lifetime. So the starting point of the behavior and the end point of the behavior, does that change as the animal ages, grows or develops? What's the function of the behavior? What does it actually give back to the individual, that species that is performing it? How does it keep it alive? How does it enable it to breed? How does it enable it to maintain itself? And what's this evolutionary trajectory? Where has it come from and where is it going? Why would the behavior continue based on the benefits that the animal gets from its performance? So causation, development, function and evolution are what we term Tim Bergen's four questions of behavioral study. And we can say that the first two in green are what we call proximate because they're all to do with the initial happenings of behavior and they are at the individual level. So the individual animal responds to a stimulus and starts the behavior, and the behavior develops in the individual animal itself. That's proximate. The two in blue are what we call the ultimate questions. So the function of the behavior has to be the same for all individuals of that species. Everybody must do that behavior in the same way to get an adaptive benefit. And evolution happens at the population level. It's not individuals that evolve, it's populations. So his ultimate questions are looking at the wider picture, the bigger picture of how that behavior is happening. 
And I've chosen this green wing macaw to kind of illustrate this aspect of the four questions, because there was a very elegant paper published a few years ago now by Emma Meller and colleagues that took the four questions and attempted to use them to understand why do we see some problem or challenging behaviours in birds that we keep in captivity? So pet parrots, for example, that might pull out their feathers. Can we look at causation, development, function and evolution to understand the types of behaviours we see when environments differ? This animal has evolved to live in the Amazon rainforest. We keep it in the family home, in a bird cage. Why do we see differences in behavioural performance? So what we've got here is a really nice example of the pure science being turned into applied science. And I'll come back to this paper and the reasons why the four questions are still an important framework for animal welfare later on. So what I've tried to do now is probably something you should never do in an online talk is um, embed a video. So hopefully you can see a video of a wild boar um, foraging in some straw enrichment. So what I thought I would do is just take each of the four questions and apply them to what's happening in this video of this animal using enrichment. So what is the causation of the behaviour? The causation of this foraging behaviour is the presence of the stimuli in the enclosure of this animal. And the stimuli in this case is this deep layer of bedding that's initiated foraging. How does this behaviour develop across the course of the individual's life history? Well, these are young wild boar. They have yet to kind of grow to adult size. They will become more adept at foraging with experience. The more they respond to different stimuli, the more they will learn from that. And therefore, that experience can be translated into better and more optimal performance of behaviour. So those are my two proximate questions of, of uh, the causation of the behaviour and of the behaviour's development. And then what about the two ultimate questions of functional evolution? What's going on here that is functional? Well, if you look at these two pigs, they are foraging in exactly the same way. They're pushing the straw around with their nose. They're using their snout with all of those sensory nerve endings. Pigs see the world through their noses to work out where food is. So by doing that, they have all evolved to do that behavior in exactly the same way to collect food efficiently, to keep those animals alive. So if we then take that into the zoo and we look at our examples of causation, development, function and evolution to zoo practice, we can think about some of the things that we do in the zoo that allow us to improve the behavioural outputs of the animal based on what we know about the importance of that behaviour to the individual animal. So here is some enrichment uh, being hung up for some rather beautiful red howler monkeys. And again, if we think about Tim Bergen's first two questions of causation and development, we can see the causation of the foraging behaviour is the recognition of the enrichment. And the usefulness of the enrichment comes greater as the animals develop more skills, more locomotor activity, more mechanical manipulative skills of using that enrichment, how they learn to um, interact with that enrichment, the other features of the enclosure that allow them to use things that are highly evolved, such as their tails for balance, for example. And all of this allows that one enrichment item of, I don't want to do this through a disservice, but a simple basket of leaves to become this three-dimensional, highly immersive, highly integrated structure that these species will use because we have taken behavioural ecology knowledge on how this animal lives in the wild and we have designed something that will cause and develop these behaviours that would take up a large proportion of the animal's time in the wild state. And I popped a reference up um, on this slide here for those of you that are interested. Um, so Georgia Mason and colleagues work on the use of environmental enrichment to tackle these unwanted or stereotypic behaviours. If we can unpick what the animal is motivated to do, what the animal is reaching for, and we can provide that in our husbandry, for example, with things like targeted and species-specific enrichment, we are ultimately improving the welfare states of the animals 
by providing for these highly evolved behavioral outputs. And then when we come to Tim Bergen's last two questions and how we can then think about ethology in the zoo that links to function and evolution, we can look at some of the research that shows us what will animals do in captivity, even if their wild ancestors are many, many generations removed from what we currently see. And there's a couple of papers out there that I think illustrate this really nicely. So the first is by Florian Hules and Angela Stoger, and it looks at vigilance and anti-predatory behaviors in meerkats. Everyone loves a meerkat. There's a reason why zoos have them really, really commonly, because they are highly engaging for the public. We also know that we can manage them in a way that is very natural, their social groups, the territory sizes that we can provide for them can be akin to what we would see out in the wild. So if we think about vigilance and this characteristic sentinel behavior that you can see this meerkat doing, what is the function of that behavior? Well, it is to ensure that any predators that are around when the rest of its mob are foraging are spotted so an early warning signal can be given and everybody goes to safety. How does that behavior evolve? Well, if you're quite simply bad at spotting predators, you and your mob are all gonna get eaten, so then you're a dead evolutionary end, bit of a brutal term, but you won't pass on your genes, so that behavior will die out because you haven't performed it very well. Only the meerkats that are good at vigilance, that are good at vigilance uh, uh, anti-predatory behaviors, are the ones that will survive long enough to breed, and so the behavior gets honed and refined over time. And this paper uh, that was published in Zoo Biology only relatively recently has shown that the sentinel behaviors that we see in captive meerkats, how much time they spend on vigilance, the posture that they um, kind of perform the vigilance behavior in is exactly the same between the zoo and the wild. So there's some innate instinctive behaviors that even though this meerkat might be many thousands of miles away from the Kalahari Desert, in a zoo in a totally different part of the world, these very important behaviors will still be performed in the same way as we see in wild individuals. And what I really, really like about this importance of putting animal behavior into the zoo management and ensuring that what we are giving to our captive species is based on evidence um, is highlighted by this example, which is another paper on comparisons of the wild and captivity. But this is even more extreme um, than my meerkat example. So this is a paper on guppies. If we've got anybody watching that likes their aquarium fish, you will be familiar with the guppy. What you can see on this slide is the wild type guppy on the left and the exaggerated form of ornamentation that we have bred in the domestic guppy. And this uh, paper took place in a zoo using domestic guppies that had been released into a semi-natural, almost free range setting in a tropical house and left to their own devices. And the anti-predatory behaviors of these feral guppies in the zoo were then compared to pet shop bought guppies, so simple domestic guppies, and they were shown to be exactly the same. So even though the guppy that you can see with the huge tail looks nothing like its wild ancestor and is probably many thousands of generations away from the wild. There are instinctive important behaviors that will still be performed by the wild type and by the domesticated form. And that's really, really important information because if there are these instinctive behaviors that animals have evolved to do and are highly conserved regardless of where they are, we must make sure we provide for those outlets. But it also shows that zoos can provide for these outlets. They can provide for these behaviors simply because they are still being shown by individuals that we have in our care. So what I've shown you so far amongst my many videos that I've been trying to play and my examples um, of the research that has looked at the causation, the development, the function and evolution of the behavior is that animals will be doing different things according to the context of the environment that surrounds them.
So if I go back to the domestic pig as my example here, if we relate that to those wild boar that I showed you earlier, yes, this animal is bigger. Yes, it's a different color. Yes, it's got floppy ears. And yes, um, it has been domesticated for a particular reason. But if you look at the digging behavior and the rooting behavior in this domestic pig, compared to those two wild boars from earlier, the behavior is occurring in exactly the same way. So there are importance to behavioral performance that seems greater than the changes that can occur from captivity or domestication or the environmental pressures on the animal. And how we provide for that, how we provide for this behavioral output of rooting and foraging in this domestic pig is exactly the same as how we would provide for it in those wild boar. So we're looking at the proximate causes of the behavior, the, the causation caused by the environment, the development of the behavior with the individual's lifespan over time, and the function of collecting food easily, and therefore its highly evolved snout allows it to do that really, really optimally. So just because it's a domestic pig, it still has the same behavioral processes going on as we see in those two wild boar. So I hope I've shown you so far that Tim Bergen's four questions are really, really useful to working out where behavior comes from, why individuals will perform that behavior in a particular circumstance, how that behavior will evolve and the function, the reason why that behavior will be performed. So what I kind of like to end on is just some examples of the wider applications of behavioral study and the four questions to zoo management overall. And I've kind of broken down these wider applications into these three basic headings. So we are hopefully all familiar with evidence-based approaches, so evidence-based husbandry, what it means, where it comes from, how we use information on the populations that we are keeping to make sure it's tip top and the best fit for that species as possible. And the four questions by their very nature allow us to collect evidence for why behaviors are performed, for what role they have in that individual's ecology and natural history, and therefore why we should think about enabling their performance in the zoo. We also know that we keep some species as conservation populations for backups for when things might go horribly wrong in the wild or for actual conservation action where species have been in captivity and are then reintroduced to either recover or augment wild populations. And finally, we've got welfare focused husbandry where we think about what are the wants and needs of that individual animal? What does it want to do? What does it need to do? What's allowing it to do that? from its husbandry? What's it finding challenging to deal with from its husbandry? We can promote the things that we know it must do and we can unravel our challenges so we allow it to do things that it wants to do at particular times of the day, particular seasons, particular areas of the enclosure that it might want to be in. So my evidence-based approaches, for example, I've got a picture of some penguins there. We know that penguins uh, forage in a particular way, and we might struggle to provide for that foraging activity in the zoo. But we do know that penguins respond really, really well to enrichment. So we can tailor the enrichment based on the outputs of our four questions by uh, looking at penguin hunting and foraging behavior and applying the four questions to what the animal is getting from the behaviors that we're seeing. Then in my middle photograph, I've got these rather delightful Madagascar potcher ducks with their ducklings. They're one of the world's rarest birds. These species, uh, the ducklings have to dive when they're fledged for their food. How efficient they are at foraging depends on the depth of the lake that they're on. If the lake is too deep and the food is too scarce, your ducklings are not gonna be successful at surviving and growing. So by working out how the animal, again, is collecting food and foraging and its enclosure usage, we can work out how best to manage any ex situ populations so that ducklings develop the right kind of skills they need for life out in the wild. And finally, uh, my example of the welfare focus husbandry concerns foraging again and rumination behavior in captive giraffe. 
if we look at those wild information that I showed you earlier from that Robin Pillow paper, how long does the giraffe spend foraging in the wild? What can we allow it to do in captivity? What should it be provided with? And therefore we promote the same types of behavioral outputs that hopefully enable the animal to have more autonomy and control over the environment that it's in. So the legacy of Tin Bergen and his four questions lives on. Although they're 60 years old, and although they were written um, many, many years ago, when we understood less about the natural world than we do today, they still have an importance to animal management, animal husbandry, and conservation outputs that come from our ex situ populations. And I just thought I'd highlight some of the work of the legacy of Tim Bergen to show you its relevance. And the first person I'd like to talk about is um, somebody I hold in very high regard. This is uh, Professor Marion Stamp Dawkins from the University uh, of Oxford. She was actually one of Nico Tim Bergen's PhD students, so he supervised her PhD. And in fact, there are numerous well-known, hopefully, names in animal behaviour that were supervised by Nico Tim Bergen. Um, and one of the most famous, I think, for the zoo crowd, if you're interested in zoo history, is Desmond Morris uh, was a PhD student of Nico Tim Bergen. But Marion Stamp Dawkins, well-known animal welfare researcher, and I've just highlighted two of her papers to show you how far we've come with our understanding of what is the relevance of behaviour to welfare. So the first is a paper that I use quite frequently. I think it's a nice example of looking at baselines for welfare assessments by understanding where has your species come from. And it's a paper that looks at behaviour patterns in domestic fowl compared to the wild ancestors of domestic fowl, which is the red jungle fowl. So what has the red jungle fowl evolved to do? What has the domestic chicken challenges of doing on the farm? And why do we see welfare infringements? And the second paper is one that is beautifully fitted to this talk uh, because it was published in relation to the 60th birthday of the four questions. And it's a, a review, it's Mariam Stan Dawkins' ideas on where do we move the four questions to in the future. If we think about what farm animals, and this is a paper purely on farm animals, what do they have as constraints on their existence? What things should we provide them with? Are all of the behaviours that we see being performed on a farm natural? And does that necessarily matter? Because some of the unnatural behaviours we might see on the farm still are positive to the animals that perform them. Interactions with stock persons, for example, or things that uh, farm animals are given to interact with, such as brushes or rollers that they can scratch against. They wouldn't ever experience that if it was a naturalistic setting. So whilst it is a farm-based paper and whilst zoo animals are not domesticated, we can still use it as a nice example of how do we move the four questions framework forwards to understand more about the behaviours that we see our animals performing and especially the wants and needs that they have that we should enable in the zoo. And the four questions also lives on across disciplines as well. And I've just taken some of these papers that have a four questions approach in them. So there's a paper on navigation behavior. Um, how do we understand where animals go and how they travel there based on the causation, the development, the function and evolution of these movement patterns? There's a really highfalutin paper on comparative brain analyses, which uh, I am no expert on but which again talks about the importance of the four questions in understanding how animals behave differently based on their cognitive processes. And why should we use the four questions to look at differences in cognitive abilities and the behavioral outputs that we see? And then a really lovely example from Susan Healy's research group at the University of St. Andrews um, that's looked at a very pure science question of a, a very familiar behavior that I'm sure we are all aware of, which is how and why do birds build nests? But again, looking at 
the developmental factors that cause nest building, what starts nest building, and why do we see all of these weird and wonderful differences in nest structure and design? And again, using the four questions approach to understand the functional reasons behind those behaviours and their evolutionary pathways. Where is bird nest building going in the future? And questions like that are really important in terms of climatic change and anthropogenic effects on ecosystems that might be changing some of these hardwired behaviours that animals have been performing for many, many thousands of years. So in summary, behaviour as a science in the zoo seems to be perennially popular. There are some really nice papers out there that will give you facts and figures on how much of a proportion of research that comes out of zoos is behavioural. And there is a reason why it's popular, because we can't ask animals what they're doing, what they're feeling, what they want or what they need. We have to infer it from their actions and responses to stimuli. It allows us to understand welfare. It allows us to evaluate husbandry. And it also allows us to understand the role of that species in a living collection at a zoo. Does it have conservation potential? Is it of uh, educational importance? So behavioural study has always, and I hope continues to be, one of the really big outputs of the living collections of zoos because of how much information we get from the behavioural data that we can collect. And an older paper now from Jeff Hosey, who I'm sure needs no introduction to many of you, has a really nice summary of the importance of behavioural research in zoos, and will also give you some facts and figures on why it's so popular. But the reason why I chose this paper to include is because if you do go and read it, um, you will find that towards the end of the paper in the discussion, there's a lovely section on research into the proximate mechanisms of behaviour. And I have already told you that two of Tim Bergen's questions are proximate questions, causation and development. So the four questions are embedded everywhere we see in behavioural outputs. They are the backbone of behavioural science and the framework for how we do objective and, and unbiased experimental designs. Behaviour by its very nature is subjective. We look, watch and observe what we see. So therefore we could put our own opinions and ideas on what we think we are seeing rather than what the animal is actually doing. So things like the four questions that are checks and balances on our explanation, on our understanding of behaviour, still remain very, very important. And again, if you'd like to know more about some of the ways in which you can conduct behavioural research in zoos, another shameless plug for one of my papers written by Dr Lisa Riley from the University of Winchester, which has summarised some of the key methods that are available including how we deal with the repeated measures of observations on the same animals again and again in our zoo research, which might be useful to any students, uh, undergraduate or postgraduates that are out there listening. So I started this talk with a summary of this 1963 paper from Nico Timbergen. I've explained his two proximate questions that are about the individual animal, and I've explained his two ultimate questions, which are about the species or population. And I mentioned a paper by Emma Meller that has looked at application of the four questions to animal welfare issues. In this case, deciphering some of the behavioural challenges we see in captive birds. And this work has been taken forwards. So here is another paper uh, by Emma Meller's research group which has shown that you can predict and therefore better understand why some species of parrot are more challenging to look after in ex situ populations based on aspects of their natural ecology. And this is not an example of beating people over the head and um, telling that they're bad because they're keeping parrots in captivity. What it's designed to do is say, look, this species is gonna cause you a challenge because in the wild, it has evolved to do X, Y, and Z. And if we don't provide X, Y, and Z, we see these other abnormal, unwanted behaviours that occur. So now we have identified the root cause of the behaviour and why that behaviour develops over the course of the individual's time in captivity. We've got those two proximate questions sorted. 
And we also understand the function of the original behavior and why it gives the animal adaptive potential. We change our husbandry, we change our management, we provide enrichment that's targeted and tailored to the species, and we can move towards eliminating these uh, poor welfare outputs that we can see because of the mismatch of the world ecology and the captive care. And without application of Tim Bergen's four questions, that wouldn't be possible. So thank you very much for listening. I hope that was uh, useful to some of you out there. I hope it's shown you the relevance of behavioural research in the zoos. And if there is any questions on what I've said, um, I'm more than happy to take them.